Hello everybody, Adam here. I was fortunate enough last week to be able to attend uh, the Engagement Excellence Summit operated by Reward Gateway. And if you'll take a moment, grab a tea, join me for a tea and a talk as I take you through the day, the speakers I saw and my takeaways from what was just a fantastic experience. So, as I've touched on there, I absolutely adored the day. Uh, if you never get the opportunity or you never make the opportunity to get out and enjoy sort of conferences, sort of speaking events, uh, even sort of breakfast seminars, do, please do. Um, I, I find them so invigorating just because it's an opportunity. You take yourself out of the day to day. Um, you are in a group of people and you're all sharing ideas. It's cross pollination and it always uh, inspires something. Uh, even sometimes if it's not directly relevant, just taking that moment, thinking about things, it makes me think about things in a different way. But this uh, was absolutely lovely. Uh, Reward Gateway's second event, they, uh, they tell me the largest uh, that they've done so far. Um, and yeah, as I say, sort of, you know, like a full schedule, it's a nine to five um, kind of situation. But all of the speakers uh, that I attended were great speakers. Uh, they all had something worthwhile to say they all gave me takeaways that I saw that and I was just like yes it doesn't just make sense in my head this is real stuff that I can take away and I can use this I can put it into practice in some manner or I can use it to develop and improve uh, my business cases for why exactly we do the things we do in terms of engagement in terms of recognition in terms of how we best motivate our people the kind of overall thread uh, of the conference was that uh, we were change makers. So we were welcomed as change makers, people who could go back and be the seed of change in their organization and, uh, and be the one to sort of enable this HR revolution uh, that we can embrace with the advantage of technology and a better understanding of ourselves and what we want. And on the subject of what we want, uh, they came out with their three things in terms of, uh, you know, you look at studies, more on this later, but respect, purpose, relationships. And it backs up things I've been to before. I mean, uh, previous events, I heard about creative communities with a cause. And really, we're talking about much the same thing. So communities, relationships, that strong sense of association and belongingness that you get from being an integral part of a human organization purpose cause it's just I'm not just here to do a job there is something worthwhile that is going on this endeavor that I am part of is delivering something of value overall and then respect sort of creativity um, it's respect for each other and for the value of the work you do the creativity in terms of being able to take autonomy to sort of drive your work. So that's where I sort of see it as being comparable with that respect. You know, I am being respected in my contribution uh, to this endeavor, to this community um, that we are creating. So yeah, it's just, you know, I'm seeing this common thread, respect, purpose and relationship, creative communities with a cause, different ways of saying the same thing, that people want to feel valued. And through the day, different speakers pick up these different parts. I mean, one section um, about pay, about financial reward. It's just like, yes, it's a major attractor. If you want to get someone through the door, right at the top of the list, huge factor. But once someone is through the door, pay, financial rewards, very poor indicator of whether or not you are likely to retain somebody of whether or not like someone is likely to be engaged. So it changes the battlefield, so to speak, in order to get the very best out of our people. We can't just be looking at financial rewards. We need to be considering the totality of what we offer. So I've been referring at the employee value proposition, the totality of the experience that you create for the individuals, as well as the value that you offer them directly. And here, Yes, we hear about the ways that work can stifle you as an individual, force you 
to submit to others, to sort of hold yourself back, to be inhibited, when actually if we want creative people, if we want successful teams, if we want people engaged and working together and working together well, we need to be finding ways to free people, to make them bring their true selves to the workplace and to be an integral part of solving a problem. So, wow, you know, huge topics. That's that's eight hours of content into just a few uh, few words. So if you stick with me, I'll run through the different sessions, uh, either uh, in one big video, or I'm actually gonna break them out into chunks as well. So if people wanna come to just one or the other, uh, they can see those separately. If you're watching this bit, you're seeing the big chunk video. Um, but yes, what a fantastic session. Join me on this journey and let's have a tea and a talk. So, the Engagement Excellence Summit. Keynote speaker, kicking the whole thing off, we start with Kylie Green from Reward Gateway. Now, really interesting start because she lays the foundation for the whole session. And what was interesting here is she makes the statement, research has shown that actually what people want from coming to work, from an organization, has not really changed that um, over the last 80 years. So studies that dig down into, yeah, what are people looking for? You know, what do they value? What do they really want out of it? It keeps bringing up the same few things and they encapsulated as respect, purpose, relationship. So respect, for each other and for the value of the work you do for the uh, for what you bring to your organization purpose that your organization is doing something worthwhile and that therefore you are your work has meaning you're contributing to something and then relationship kind of that interconnectedness in the workplace the fact that you're not just all cogs in machine working together but you are partners you are working together equally and that you feel connected to the people around you. And so think about that. That's back to the 40s. 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, noughties, 10s, and now into the 20s, the new roaring 20s. And we get hung up on the generational aspect. And indeed, there was some interesting stuff about sort of generational attitudes. But whilst we may think that people want different things, no, not really. How people express what they want or kind of what their expectations are may be different, but actually what people value in a workplace, what they are keen to receive is actually the same. And it has been the same consistently through these studies. So there is that thread there. So people are after respect, purpose and relationship. Kylie uh, brought to my attention the engagement bridge uh, that Rod Gateway uh, produce. Really loved it. Uh, if you want to, you can check it out really easy. Uh, rg.co backslash bridge. Fantastic. rg.co slash bridge. Um, and it's kind of showing how do you nurture and feed true engagement in your organization? And one of those lovely things that kind of crystallizes a bit like Maslow's hierarchy of needs in that, you know, you've got different bricks, you know, here is pay and sort of, you know, working hours and uh, things at the bottom. But then here you have these other elements that all stack up and yeah, you need all of them and you can't skip any. So all of these are different things that come together. Um, and yeah, she brought it to life with real life examples from her work. Uh, from Reward Gateway clients of how they had uh, different organisations have managed to deliver significant turnaround in engagement in their organisation and how each of those campaigns kind of focused or delivered on different parts of the engagement bridge. Really interesting example with Holden, uh, Vauxhall, as we know them in the UK, um, who had a car factory in Australia. It was their last remaining car factory. The town it was based in, uh, essentially it's you know, the majority of the workforce or work in this factory. And a decision had been made that the factory was going to be closed down in four years time. And this posed an interesting question for the management of that um, factory, because the thing is, they now know 
that factory is closing. That's something that they can sit on for four years or they can share that information. They can tell their workforce. Now, a lot of places I've worked, uh, they would keep it a secret. It's too early to tell people, oh, how will they react? Oh, I'll demotivate them or everyone might leave and it'll be leave us in the lurch. But a really key part of this whole thing is open and honest communication. And this is a personal thing for me where I have been frustrated over the years about, um, long story short, I mean, one place, you know, we knew something was gonna happen. It's just like, look, can we not just tell people now? And the answer I got is just like, no, because we're never normally this open. And if we're this open now, people won't trust us. They won't believe us because we've never done this before. And it's just, ah, oh, what a vicious circle to be caught in where it's just, oh, we can't be open and honest because we've never been open and honest before and how will people trust us until we do it? Anyway, so this factory in Australia, uh, they made the right decision, the courageous decision, and they told their workforce. They engaged with them. They said, look, this is the situation. The factory is gonna close. And it was beautiful because they came together with that. They set themselves the challenge that the last car they build would be the very best car that they'd ever built. And in fact, by finding this collective purpose, by being open and honest and working together as a team, they did. They significantly raised their standards. They raised their standards and they were a world-class standard facility at the point they closed. And it goes to show just how it rewards. If you engage with people, if you're open and honest with them, if you respect them, you give them a purpose, you show that relationship, you come together. A few other interesting tidbits. Um, in particular, uh, it was sort of about a buying team, but an interesting sort of view on group dynamics and actually in terms of decision making. So it was explaining that a buying team and sort of likelihood to buy. So if you've got one person uh, involved in sort of the buying team making the decision, the likelihood of making a purchase is around 80%. If that team has two to five people, then the likelihood of making a purchase decision is around 60%. So it falls, but you know, it's there. But once you get to six plus, the likelihood of making a purchase decision drops to around 30%. So kind of something we know and we're aware of, you know, too many people involved can really slow down decision making. But it was interesting in terms of, okay, what's a good size to lead a group? Uh, to sort of, you know, to be uh, that sort of central sort of thinking agent and then to engage with subgroups. So actually, you know, sort of once you get over five, potentially you're slowing things down. So in terms of being change makers, in terms of enabling change and trying to make it happen, it's a consideration to bear in mind. And a little takeaway important for me is really thinking about how you can use all your stakeholders, uh, especially your skeptics. So you want to make change and you've got someone that is always uh, criticizing or always pulling it down or they're, they're a negative Nelly. And you can feel like, oh, I don't want to talk to that person. Oh no, I'm going to get it through everyone else and then I'll go to them. Or like, oh, can we not just go around them? And it's remembering how much value they have. Because if there is one thing that your skeptic is always going to do, they are going to give you honest and direct feedback on your plan. And uh, in particular, later, um, we see, you know, the, the pieces about the importance of engaging everybody of sort of an equal contribution. So use everyone and especially your skeptics. In many ways, they can be your strongest partner in making robust change happen. So that was Kylie Green. On to the next session. Hi, the Engagement Excellence Summit. Wow. Second session with Bruce Daisley, a former VP of EMEA at Twitter. Uh, now seems to be, you know, a, a, he's a great speaker. He's one of my tens for the show. And uh, it's sort of fascinating, you know, with these things, people don't tend to say like, oh, this is what I'm going to accomplish. But what I took away was he outlined first 
different ways that organisations stifle their employees in the workplace, how they sort of hamper them and uh, you know close down their creativity, their, their power. Uh, and then simple ways to lift that, to reinvigorate them, to free themselves so they can bring their true self to the uh, workplace and really contribute. So different ways were stifling people in the workplace. Well, he introduced me uh, to our toxic best friend, Cortisol. And we all know stress can be uh, really powerful. Uh, in the short term because you know it's a it's a superpower our body sort of you know it perks up it's readies itself for the challenge but long-term stress uh yeah is completely the opposite and he was providing it as kind of the science behind it it's useful to know that we are not just talking about feelings that there is a physical biological component here there is a science about what we are doing to our own bodies to our brains when we um, set up and normalize certain environments. And the thing is, one of the things that cortisol will do is it stifles creativity. So if you are stressed, if you are in a long-term situation where you are working incredibly hard, incredibly long hours, you will get less creative with time. Your people will get less creative with time. So you are harming the creativity and the problem-solving abilities of your organization. Interesting thought is, on that subject of creativity, think about uh, power. Power is disinhibiting. So imagine you go into a meeting or into your boss's office and they stick their feet up on the desk. They can do that. They're the boss. They're in charge. You know, yeah, okay. Now imagine, would you walk into their office, sit down and pop your feet up on their desk? No. No, not really. I'm sure there are some people there just going, no, that would be, ta what, ah, why would you? That, oh, how disrespectful. And yet, if you think about it, power is disinhibiting. You feel free, you feel open, you can relax. So what's the opposite of that? If you go into the office and you are inhibited, if you are holding back, if you are being respectful and deferring to other people, you know, fine, it's got its place. But the thing is, you are stifling your creativity. You're holding it back. You're not bringing your true self out. So, and that led to uh, an interesting sort of thing like um, ego depletion. So, as a basic concept, it's something I've heard before. We are capable of only making a certain amount of decisions in the day, um, that our brain power is a finite limited resource. It's just, we, we can operate, but once we hit our point, we stop making clear conscious decisions. We start to get a little bit random. And I've heard that before, like CEOs that always wear the same clothes, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, in fact, one of the CEOs, uh, an entrepreneur, co-founder um, co of a business I worked with, always wore the same sort of tan trousers and white shirt. Um, but it reduces decision making because you wake up in the morning. There's no what am I going to wear? You reach in, you grab out your trousers and your shirt, the same ones you always wear. And then you go. You've not engaged your brain. You've saved a little bit of power. And so, again, we stifle creativity. If we are working long hours, if we are constantly on the go, we're wearing that mental willpower down. And once we hit the brakes, once we're working late, or you know, once we're working, you know, getting in early and doing all these things, if we're skipping lunch, we're getting close to our maximum. We're looking at exceeding our maximum. And again, productivity can drop. And the final sort of piece in terms of stifling the workplace, connecting back into all this, all of this was in connected, fascinating um, presentation. Uh, a quote from a um, chap called Gregory Burns saying, uh, it was a study with rats, and but it was looking at how we have different senses, we have different sort of modes for engaging with and understanding the world. And our exploratory sense is kind of our curious one. It's the one where we're looking around, we're exploring our surroundings, we want to understand them and see what's going on. 
but we have our fear sense as well. And if we think we're in danger, if we think um, you know something stressful is going on, the fear sense engages. And when the fear sense engages, the exploratory sense stops. Because it's a risk. The fear sense, I need to stay inside my bubble now. I need to close down. And this fascinating study looking at rats, looking at um, putting them in cages, having them explore their surroundings, what's going on, how mental sort of exploratory actions were they doing. And then take a single cat hair, pop it in the cage, see what happens. And yeah, suddenly smell a predator, stopped. Fear sense kicks in, all the exploratory actions stop. And importantly, even when they took the cat hair out, cleaned the cage, popped the carrots back in, the exploratory sense did not just kick back in. They had been inhibited, their actions had been sort of closed down, and it took several days for the exploratory sense to return, and even then, they were exploring about half the rate they were before. So, by creating a stressful environment, or an environment of fear, or inhibiting environment, we are shutting down the creativity, the exploratory senses of our employees. But what can we do about that? So Bruce offered five ways to free ourselves in the workplace. And um, yeah, uh, you know, not the most complicated things. Um, he suggested think. So understand about when we get our ideas, like... Uh, you know, we kind of know, like, you don't really get ideas when you're sort of actively focusing on the problem. So often you hear, like, you know, take a break, go and think about something else, come back to it. And yes, a daydreaming kind of state is when we are at our most creative. That is when you make random associations about issues. So actually, if we want to encourage people, we need to find ways to encourage them uh, not to just, you know, daydream or like drift off, but but to find that openness, to find that space, to allow them a bit of room to think round a problem, to be creative and not to be just laser focused, task, 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 task. Team, feeling connected to each other is a transformative experience. So we are more productive as a group when we are part of an overall sense of belonging. And he threw in uh, an example with rowers. So uh, taking rowers, sticking them in the gym, sticking them on rowing machines, and you had two different sort of uh, groups going on. So line them up all in a row. So they're in competition with each other. They are sitting there and they're rowing as hard as they can. And yet, oh, you know who can do the most? They're competitive people. And so they go at it and they do their rowing. And then the other group, they put the machines in a row. Uh, so, you know, they're behind each other like they would be in a boat. And the only instruction they were given is that you need to row in time with each other. And actually, those two groups covered around the same distance. Being in competition didn't make them inherently more productive. So rowing together worked. But when they took a look at the physiological results, so what had happened to their bodies as a result of this, they found endorphin levels, so sort of the pleasure chemical, the, uh, the sort of uh, the sense of uh, belonging, that were twice as high in the group that were working together. Relax. Face-to-face -face interactions are more productive and more relaxing than other types of interaction. So... Um, you know, just sending emails or, you know, the occasional quick phone call. Yeah, it, it doesn't stack up to a face to face conversation. You are more likely to, you know, engage fully. You've got all those different layers of communication. You've got all the physical layers going on as well. And you're more likely to have that sort of free roaming conversation and to share useful information and sort of, you know, to talk on random topics. So you build that sense of connectedness and you are more likely to share sort of, you know, just random bits of information that tie people together. Settling in. Wasn't too sure where I was going to go with this, but it's the concept of how you can get people to settle into the workplace. So they are bringing their true selves to work. And by that, I mean the piece of you that is not inhibited. 
So we've talked about, you know, the stifle piece, the piece that's uh, afraid to make suggestions or sort of will just defer. It's like, no, how can we get people to settle in, feel relaxed, feel, yes, you're part of this group. Welcome to us. Bring who you are. We want to know who you are and we want to see that here so that we can get the very best of you in terms of uh, helping out and resolving our issues. And finally, belonging. So much of what humans do is in service of belongingness. We, we do it for each other or we do it because we think it will be good for the group. Um, you know, it's just like, yes, there are selfish actions, but there are a lot of selfless people or people that do things because they think it's the right thing to do for a group or even just to fit in with a group. It doesn't have to be altruistic. And actually that uh, as an indicator of mortality, loneliness is actually a bigger indicator of uh, mortality than obesity. Lonely people are more likely to die than obese people. Well, that's pretty shocking. And just think about what that means for just us as human beings. I mean, a lack of connection, uh, a feeling of isolation. Yeah, these are harmful things. So the opposite is a better thing. So how can we bring people together? Not all just doing, you know, like uh, team lunches or all those sorts of things, but even just encouraging those interactions, making us feel that we belong to each other, that we are part of a connected group. So Bruce in there, ways that we just stifle ourselves in the workplace and ways that we can free ourselves up to give our very best and to be the best at solving issues. Okay. Thank you very much. On to the next session. Hi, so the Engagement Excellence Summit into the first of the breakout sessions and then after lunch to one of the keynote speakers. So I'm going to cover both together here. Um, uh, in, in a torturous decision, Rural Gateway gave us five different choices for each of the breakout sessions and they all looked great. Major piece of feedback was just, I want to be selfish. I want to see more of these. Uh, although I've been reminded all of these sessions, so all the breakout sessions, the keynote sessions, they are being recorded. Um, so if you weren't able to attend or if you weren't able to see some of the other sessions, you can see them later. So keep an eye out with Reward Gateway stuff. They are coming. I chose to see the first of the two rec strategic recognition sort of threads uh, and it was a great place to work. So uh, as the name suggests, their operation is recognizing great places to work um, and in particular it gives them access to sort of organization allows them to sort of compare what's going on in organizations that we recognize are great places to work and what goes on in organizations uh, that are not what's the sort of difference and yes uh, the, the organizations that they recognize they they have uh, roughly 40 percent more applications per job than other organizations. So they've got a great brand out there. Um, employees stay longer. They're more likely to be engaged. Um, so to be proud of the work that they're involved in um, and therefore delivering more. Now, this was the session where um, it was highlighted that yes, pay is a huge factor in attracting people into the workplace. If you're advertising a role and trying to get someone through the door, pay is right up there, top of the list, okay? That's what people need. But once you've got them through the door, pay, financial rewards, are a very poor indicator of how likely someone is to be engaged or to stay. So, we need to get pay right. We need pay to be fair. We need to get people through the door with an attractive looking package. But once they're here, pay is not the best motivator. Pay is not what keeps people here necessarily. So we need to look wider at the things that do. And yes, it is the total rewards. It's the total package and the total experience that you deliver. And immediately we are right back to the themes of the conference. We are back to respect purpose and relationship. We are about valuing people, giving their work meaning, and yes, engaging them, recognizing them. Now, 
In terms of the session, um, you know, really fascinating. It was kind of drawing on a, a wealth of their experience and just sort of interactions with all sorts of different size organisations. So in terms of uh, what they covered, it's sort of, you know, a few bits and bobs. It's sort of food for thought. Like if you're going to deliver something, you know, kind of like these are things that different organisations, different sizes, different sectors have chosen to do. Straight off the bat, an organisation that had formed a reward and recognition committee. So, issue they were trying to resolve. Um, if you think about it, often uh, initiatives will come up from the HR team or from management and they'll be signed off by senior management. Now, that's okay, but it's providing a certain point of view. And the thing is, you might be coming up with things that really resonate with that kind of population. So the more senior manager population, maybe higher earners, but you might be missing and kind of, you know, not really offering true value to uh, the whole organization. So the different parts of it, the different levels. So by having a recognition and reward committee formed of people from different roles, different levels across the business, it means that they have a group um, of all different views who are looking at and proposing options that would work for all different parts. So not necessarily, you know, stuff that works for everybody, but stuff that is least making sure there are different pieces of the package or different things you're doing that do touch all different parts of the organisation. So no one is sort of left out. One simple thing, we know that uh, recognition uh, is best personalised. It needs to be personal to the individual rather than something just generic or one size fits all. Um, so an organisation, when people join, uh, giving them a, uh, a my favorite things list to complete. So just here you go, you know, drop down a, a few things that you like, things that are hobbies, you know, things that you do. And that way you've just got a little record to tap into so that if you want to do something for the individuals, fantastic, here's a thing, I can get this and I can go, great, oh, I can see, you know, they really enjoy stamp collecting, they really enjoy, you know, uh, jigsaws whatever it might be, you know, this is the extent of my hobbies, you know, oh my God, how exciting is my life? Um, but yes, you can get something targeted for them. And then you've got someone else, they're off clubbing or skiing and you can do something for them. But you've got that bit of information about them. Kind of simple to build in, gather, and then, yeah, make things more personalised. Um, a manager recognition toolkit. So, I mean, to be honest, this is just a great one uh, that everyone should do. But if you've got recognition programmes, having like a proper little toolkit that not just explains how you do recognition in your organisation, but offers a range of options, some choice for the organisation and how you do it. And this is helpful because the thing is, recognition is not one size fits all. Some pieces, it will be a team environment and people will prefer team recognition. Some people will prefer individual recognition, but that might be a big fuss. It might be a quiet word. A toolkit that provides options for managers so that they can tailor it to the needs of their area. Fantastic. Um, making sure, uh, offering coaching and for your managers on how to provide feedback. We know that most people don't take managerial roles for the first time because they're best at being a manager. It's a different skill set. And we don't often look for that skill set when we promote. More often, it's just we think you're really great at the job you do. Now, please lead a team and share that greatness. And actually, providing good feedback, positive or negative, is not an inherent uh, human skill. Um, you know, it's just, I, I think a lot of people suck at it, to be honest. It's just like, we're, you know, we're reluctant to do it. It's just like, well, how can we provide the feedback sandwich, positive, negative, positive? You know, it's really important because I don't want to demoralize people. And it's just like, yeah, you know, that can be part of it. But it's just like, we worry about it. We want it to come across well. You know, we're reluctant to do negative feedback. We can um, overstress positive feedback to the extent that people don't even realize that there's any negative feedback. Certainly had that one in performance rating uh, appeals. And so, yeah, help your people out. Feedback is important. It's how we shape people and how we make them grow. So give them a helping hand. Help them help their people by providing them great feedback. Really interesting one, but changing the script on costs. So 
Often when it comes to recognition or engagement, uh, there's all sorts of good reasons to do it. But part of it um, focuses on the fact that, well, if we can engage people, they'll stay longer. If they're staying longer, we're not recruiting as much. And if we're not recruiting as much, then we save money. The direct costs of recruitment and also the indirect costs of having a break in employment. And everywhere I've worked, that's been presented as a potential saving, which is great. You know, it's this whole piece. Oh, it shows we're commercial. It shows we're thinking about the bottom line. But actually, in some ways, that lacks vision. Why not take that external cost and turn it into an internal budget? To say, look, having a more engaged and motivated workforce is in itself intrinsically valued valuable. It raises the productivity of the team. It improves us across the board. Yes, we might save on uh, recruitment. But the thing is, when we have to spend money to make this happen, and you do need to spend money, not the earth, you can do it with a comparatively small budget. But still, you can have real difficulty getting sign off for the money that will actually add the value and make these things change. So often it's like, oh, can we not just do something with like basic cards or just saying thank you? And it's like, oh, yes, you can. That's a part of it that helps. But couldn't we do more? And indeed, it reminds me of a state in the US where they were looking at their um, sort of their benefits, uh, in particular for out of work mothers. And they had a really interesting program where what they did was they invested heavily in sort of state funded childcare. So how can we help get single mothers and sort of and, and families overall, how can we help them get back into the workplace by providing affordable childcare? And their point was that they didn't save any money. So they kind of reduced their overall bill in terms of, you know, unemployment benefits and support for these non-working people. But at the same time, they were spending a similar amount, but providing on the childcare. But their point overall was, we have created a better environment. These people are working. They have a better sense of self-worth. They're not on handouts. Um, they are now spending inside the economy. We have spent the same overall amount of money, but we have put it to better use. And I think that's a fantastic attitude to start taking, especially when we look at the bills for recognition. We are taking money and we are redistributing it for a better purpose. And a final interesting one from them was uh, a place with summer hours. In terms of their organisation, they found most of their work was in Q4 and Q1. That was where big projects would land and where they'd tend to find the largest work. So if Q1 and Q4 is a business and people are actually tending to put in more hours around that time, in the summer, they ran summer hours. So in one place, you leave work at 2 p.m. on a Friday, just over the summer period. And it's an informal way of giving back to people and sort of recognising Yes, you put in more here, but this is where we can sort of give it back to you. This is where we can say thank you for what you've done. We recognise you've put in more. And this is the give and take of that situation. So great places to work, some insights into other places and things that they've done. Not for everyone, but great ideas to start thinking about, to consider. Another session, first keynote after lunch. Uh, I want to cover here. Just because I realised I didn't have as much to say about it. Um, it was a great session. It was uh, Seville Rahmova, uh, apparently sort of the product brains behind Reward Gateway's platform. And um, had some inspiring things, which I'll, I'll cover. Uh, but she was more talking about the platform itself. You know, fair enough. This is Reward Gateway Shindig. Uh, we're here because of them, you know, and they wanted to talk about the platform themselves. So in terms of the more general stuff, um, very interesting speech. She was sort of tying together... Um, kind of like different great moments in HR history. Uh, so, you know, putting the juxtaposition that, you know, think back to the start of the Industrial Revolution. We have a, a situation where it is the norm that children might work 14 hours a day, six days a week. That was the status quo. That was where we were. And you had pioneers, you had change makers 
that changed that status quo, that said, doing this with our children is insane. I need to take them out. I want to educate them. I want to get them in full-time education. And yes, use this time to train them, not just as yeah, my workforce. And so we've been through these different changes and are we here standing at the cusp of another one? We have incredible technology that we have never had access to before. We are discovering new ways of digitizing our interactions and working remotely, but also connecting in ways that we've never had before. And is this a place where in a hundred years time, people might look back and say, this was it. This was a moment in HR history where things changed, where we changed the status quo and how we went about doing things. So quite an interesting call to action and sort of how can we be a change maker? In terms of reward gateways tools, I haven't worked with them directly. I don't know them personally. Um, what was interesting for me is just, I've spoken in uh, about Kylie Green session. She has the reward, uh, sorry, the engagement bridge. So they have this concept of all the different ways that you can nurture and build engagement inside your organization. And they've built a tool which is touching across these aspects. Um, and that's always interesting for me because it's just, there's an eternal dilemma. If you've got something that does everything, it tends not to do everything well. There'll be areas where it's weaker and it's just like, you know, I love these bits, but these bits, I've kind of got them, but you know, they're not quite there. Do I really want to get someone else to come in and do it? And then equally, um, you can get single um, focus providers that will do an excellent platform, but you've got a single platform. So if you want to do a variety of things, you have to have lots of different platforms that can lead to sort of different experiences, different logins. Is that the best way of going around it? So with Reward Gateway's um, platform, my takeaway is that they offer a great solution over a variety of different things in terms of recognition, engagement, socialization, um, surveys, uh, analytics. They're doing all these different things. And if they're doing them well, it is definitely a worthwhile product to be checking out. And certainly if there is one takeaway from this summit, it is that Reward Gateway as an organization have absolutely the right idea about engagement. You are working with an organization that is trying to take you and their product in the right direction. So certainly anywhere I go in the future, Reward Gateway is gonna be in there as one of the organizations that I want to talk to about my situation, about what I'm trying to accomplish and see how they can be a partner in delivering that great place to work. All right, thank you very much. And on to the next session. Okay, Engagement Excellence Summit, and on to my absolute favorite session of the uh, the whole summit. And, you know, this is my moment to like totally fanboy out. I've got a new favorite in Alex Powell. So part of Reward Gateway, uh, the organization out in the US, and uh, got this little introduction, like, you know, anything that she doesn't know about recognition is not worth knowing. And that's high billing. You know, what are we gonna get? And right in from the front, uh, wonderfully engaging, wonderfully knowledgeable, uh, as a 10 out of 10, total fanboy now, I'm on team Alex. So, why was she so good? Uh, what was it that I took away from this? Um, so, we come back to respect, purpose and relationship. So this concept of what people really want, we've got studies back into the 40s, 50s, 60s, and they are all summarizing the same things. People want to work places with uh, self-expression, with purpose, where you have you know, good relationships, that you imagine really different environments, but it's just the people are still people. They still want these things. Indeed, she touched on an interesting piece about the generation. So, we tend to think of sort of the uh, the generations of boomers, Generation X, millennials, as very different, wanting different things. And it's just, it's not so much, when you look at it, it's not so much they want different things, but they have a different attitude and understanding towards how you might receive those things. So uh, positioning it as like, look, the boomer generation, the company provides your career. So you still want respect, purpose, and relationship, but 
you join a company trusting that they will give it to you, that they will take you places, that you'll go around doing the work that's needed and that you will get those things. That then with Gen X, actually you start to get the generation that they were focused on the profession. So this is what I do, this is what um, I can deliver and I can find that from different places. And then the millennial sort of being brought up by the uh, Gen X generation um, who expect it, who say, yeah, that should be the norm. Uh, I want these things and I can go to an organisation that will deliver me these things. That's, that's what I should get. Yes, surely. And yeah, that's what Gen X have raised their kids to believe. You know, they fought for it. They're going to get it. But ultimately, they're all after the same thing. So even though there's different generational attitudes towards work and how people might want to go about it, fundamentally, you're trying to deliver on those three aspects. And recognition is so powerful because it can hit every single one of those. So what I liked is just that it wasn't just uh, the talk. It was, OK, how are ways that you can do this? How can I help you understand what recognition is, how you do it, why you do it, where you do it, when you do it? And not just you, but how can I help you talk to other people about it. So you want to start a journey of recognition. Quick and easy ways, the one plus one plus one challenge. What is it? Can you give one thank you on a daily basis? Just make sure you say thanks. Thank you. I appreciate what you did for me. That was great. Once a week, can you do something a bit more formal? So can you take a moment to really call out a great piece of work that's been done, whether that's in a team or sort of, you know, a more you know direct conversation and really sort of laying it out. And then once a month, can you do some sort of uh, can you actually send a reward? Can you actually give something tangible to someone, um, whether or not it's a nomination into a recognition program or some sort of, you know, like token recognition? Uh, sorry, a token of your recognition. And yeah, just simple ways to do it. And she was explaining like she diarizes Friday, third, fourth, uh, 3.30. Reflect. Who's given me something this week that actually deserves a call out? You know, sort of build it in and build that culture of recognition. Because if you think about it, we are typically programmed to see what's broken, what's not working. And so you can become a bit negative. You can focus on what's not right and lose sight of what is good, of what is working. And this is a way to call it out. She gave a little bit of uh, advice on sort of how to recognize. So, you know, ways to sort of do it right. Have a nice little acronym, if you like acronyms. So AVI, AV. So that's tell me the action. So Alex, I really enjoyed the session that you did at the summit. Connect it to a value, so a value in your organization um, or, you know, sort of like the value that you want to see more of. And it's just uh, for me, Alex, I really enjoyed your session at the summit. It was so insightful and inspiring. So I really got a lot out of it. And then share the impact to the I. Explain why it matters to you. So Alex, I really enjoyed your session at the engagement summit. It was really inspiring and insightful. And I feel better prepared now to go into a room of senior people, of uh, shop floor workers, and explain why we need to do something. So it's made me better at my job. Thank you so much. So there we go, building it, not just the thank you, um, you know, which is just simple thank you can be good, but working through all those things, action, value, impact, really sort of, you know, laying out why it is. Why are we recognising? So I said, you know, now I feel I can explain to people uh, the value of it and what we're going to get out of it. And simply put, if you recognise, you'll get more. So recognise what you want to see more of. You know, just think about it. It's just like you do something. You don't hear anything about it. It exists in a vacuum. It's like, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. You don't have any objective point of view. You do something and someone comes along to you and they says, thank you for doing that. It's just like, oh, good. 
that made a difference, that made an impact. I've, I've helped people. This is good to do. So you do it and then you will do it again because you know you've been recognized. This is what I need to do to get more recognition. It feeds that sense. People want this. People want to know they're doing good work. So tell them. So, but importantly, um, it's not just about going above and beyond. And a, a lovely little piece sort of getting into sports analogies. Uh, Alex did her best for a British audience. She threw cricket into it for us. She only uses uh, the American football, but you know, it, it works with any sort of sport really. Because the thing is, recognition is not just about winning championships, okay, or tournaments. It is about recognizing the day-to-day -day effort and providing consistent feedback. So think about it. Um, you know, it's just, it's not just tournaments. You don't only praise someone when they win a tournament. You don't only praise people when they win matches. Think about it. What about good plays, good shots, putting in the hard effort, putting in the running, putting in the, the tackles, the, uh, the blocks. If you see someone doing good things, you cheer it. You say, great work, you know, brilliant tackle, come on. Okay, you cheer for these people. You recognize the effort. And the thing is, and that's because it is inspiring. You are saying, good work. These are all the incremental gains, the pieces that build to the goals, to the score. This is what builds the wins. This is what builds the championships. So these are the blocks that you have to put in place. She explained the importance also of taking the time to sort of recognize outside of just your team and group. So back to the sort of the relationship um, angle that, um, yeah, actually, you know, just recognition is a really good way to share impact and sort of understanding and appreciation for what different areas do. So if someone comes back to me and says, I really appreciate what you did for me because it let me do this. That's giving me some insight into what they do. Um, I might even like really appreciate how I impact their work or what it is that they do and that's so important about what I do. And that will make me feel good, obviously, but also it will help me connect to that person, make me understand that again, we do not exist in a vacuum. Every job is intrinsically linked to every other job. Businesses do not employ dispensable people. They don't want to spend the money. Um, you know, if a job exists, it exists because it has a purpose and because it needs to do something. So taking the time to sort of recognize people outside of just your team and group and sort of calling out where their stuff has really helped you is really great at building those relationships, building that connectedness and sense of belongingness in the wider organization. Now, organizations can recognize anywhere. You know, recognition is not just one thing. Uh, I spoke before about sort of manager toolkit, you know, providing different ways to recognize that suit the organization and suit the people. So you can do it in one-to-ones, you can do it at someone's desk, you can do it in the corridor. Um, people put posters up or put it on screens. Um, if you have regular meetings, why not start your meetings and just start some sharing a success? On a positive note, call out, this happened. I just wanna to say to everybody, this was great. Thank you for doing that, that was really helpful. And also um, social media. Think about it. I mean, one of the things, when I left my last organization, I realized how poor I am at making recommendations on LinkedIn, of calling out the great people that I really appreciate that did the really good work for me. And yeah, it's just like, let the whole world know these are great people. I want to sing the praises of the people I work with. I want, you know, everyone that's in my network to know, actually, if you need someone, this person, check them out. They're awesome because they do good things for me. So not on a daily basis, you know, but just, yeah, it's a tool. You can use it. You can call out people. And also, um, you know, a, a plug for Reward Gateway, but also genuinely a good point. Online recognition sort of so through internet sort of enabled um, tools like Rural Gateway's recognition platform <coughs> but obviously like most modern ones is really a game changer because 
It is a really simple way to share and socialize recognition. So it's so important that you can call out someone and say, this was great and let everyone else see that you've called that out and you've, you've said, this is great. And that they can talk about it and interact it, reinforce it and go, yeah, that, that was brilliant. I really appreciate it if you were the guy that was doing that. Um, and so it increases the value of the recognition. It increases the visibility. So back to that point, this, you recognize what you want to see more of. So if I do something and I get a thanks, it's like, oh, great. You know, that, I did that and I got a thanks. I'll do more of that. But think about if you see someone else getting thanked for doing something. Oh, that's what gets thanks. That, that's what adds value. I should be doing some of that then, if, if, that's, if that's what we recognize, if that's what we value. So it becomes this kind of social memory and collective conscious where you can see what's being recognized. And importantly, check out people and see what's been said about them in the past. You know, see what gets called out, what is being appreciated. So it's a way to sort of take recognition that might just be small and isolated and sort of magnify it across the organization. Last little thing was um, sort of, you know, not to just leave this in a vacuum. So encourage people to sort of serve up opportunities to recognize each other. Um, so, you know, great if you can spot something and think, yeah, take the time to mention it. But think about leaders in your organization. Think about managers of your team. How much would they appreciate you going to them and going, I don't know if you knew this person in my team or in my area, they did something, it was great. Fantastic. That gives them the chance to recognize their people and reinforce their message in a way that they, you know, they can't know everything. They can't see everything. They need to be kept informed. So don't think of recognition as just something that you need to give. It needs to be something that needs to be talked about wider. So and feel free to, to share it. I mean, one of the things that makes me laugh is there, you know, uh, it's almost it's a semi joke, but it's serious that if you want to get a reputation as being a good person, uh, give good gossip about people behind their back. You know, like, oh, I would never say this to their face, but they're a really great person. Um, and, you know, that gets back and it gives you a reputation for being humble. And it's just like, yeah, it's a bit of a joke thing. But at the same time, like, how, how good does it feel to know you've been talked about positively? To know you have a reputation for doing something that you didn't even know you had a reputation for doing. So... Alex, thank you so much. I've said this to you in person at the end of the session. You were ace, absolutely loved it. Total fanboy, team Alex, and thank you very much. And with this, on to the final session of the day. Hello, Engagement Excellence Summit. Last session of the day, Margaret Heffernan, so closing keynote speech. Now, uh, as you expect from any kind of, you know, uh, closing session, you expect big things, you know, people can do fantastic uh, work in these. And yeah, Margaret's was good. I really enjoyed it. And it's, it's one of those lovely ones where, um, you know, she pops up, she's got no slides. Uh, she's there. It's sort of like, you know, you just sort of feel like, oh, this is a, you know, this could be a fireside chat. So it's kind of like quite a warm, quite an engaging style. And um almost a situation where she's talking uh, gently and you're kind of like lulled in and drawn into this and what are you weaving? Where are we going with this? And I'll be honest, not immediately apparent to me. Um, she was sort of giving this example of places she worked and sort of, you know, like being very honest about, you know, look, we're looking for people that love the challenge, that will wake up in the middle of the night thinking about stuff and, you know, wanting to get onto it. And, and at that point, I'll be honest, I was a little a little where's this going you know this this seems toxic you know it's just like oh I, I want people that are thinking about work all hours or, or what is this and um you know no that's not where she's going at all um actually it was sort of yeah really about sort of the people that they that you have that you work with I mean that piece was really about sort of trying to get um people that enjoy the thrill of the challenge uh, in that specific example. So just, you know, creating a culture where you've got these challenge seekers that more than anything love an insurmountable problem. And that was tying into the concept um, 
you know, so we're, we're back to respect, relationship and purpose. And people need to have purpose in their work. And purpose is where you have real value and intrinsic meaning in your role. And so for these people, the intrinsic meaning was challenge. And she gave other examples. So the British National Health Service. So, you know, that's a tough working environment. Um, you know, it's a, a political football. It gets not from, you know, one team to the other every few years. There always seems to be restructures. There always seems to be a funding crisis. And yet you have people that know that they are changing lives. They are ending suffering. Um, inherently, they have true value and purpose. You have CERN. So the scientists working there with the Large Hadron Collider, they are looking for things that don't exist yet but they might never exist. It might be wrong, but they don't know and they have to put huge time and effort and resource into trying to answer a question that may never be answered. Yet you have people who are building things that they might never actually get to use themselves in their lifetime, but they still want to because it is part of this wider mission, wider vision. Arab architects, they want to build the buildings that no one else can build. They want those challenges. What you want to do, that's insane. No one's ever done that. We don't know how, but that's what we thrive on because that's what gives us value and meaning. So purpose. And in there, what sort of, how can you deliver on people and help them deliver on that purpose? And in some of kind of like the relationship and the respect piece, again, we tie back into this idea that Experiments have shown that sort of the more focused you are on money, that the less focused you are on others. So actually, if your rewards and your motivation are dangling financial carrots and trying to get people to, to do more for cash, actually you are focusing people towards individual options and individual approaches rather than team approaches, rather than group approaches. And why does that matter? Well, um, where you set up individual success, um, whether that's through forced ranking or putting people into competition with each other, I talked about Bruce Daly's session where actually working as a team, you get the same results and higher endorphin levels. Um, but you are discouraging cooperation. That actually, if you're trying to position people above each other, the incentive you're creating is not to help each other. Actually, how can I maintain my position? How can I get above each other? I've got information. If I give this to other people, I might be threatening my position. I might be threatening my financial reward. So I should keep this to myself. Is that what we want? Not really. We want people working together. We want people sharing information. And there was a, an absolutely beautiful example she gave. It's a study of uh, looking for correlations between IQ and problem solving. So correlation is not causation. It doesn't necessarily mean that one thing is the other, but is there some kind of connection in terms of results? And straight off the bat, yes, there seems to be a, a general correlation between an individual's IQ and an individual's problem solving ability. So the higher your IQ, fine, the more likely you are to be able to individually solve a problem. So far, so unexceptional. But now let's put people into groups. And how good is a group at problem solving? Well, they did not find a correlation between the group's collective IQ and their ability to problem solve. So if you put all of the highest IQ people into a single group, they are not inherently more uh, able to solve problems than if you had put all the lowest IQ people into a group. Uh, equally, if you had a few high IQ leaders and then followers, you know, lower IQ followers to be in there, no, that there's no correlation share. Correlation there. So suddenly IQ is not the factor. How smart you are as individuals in a group does not make you the most productive, does not make you the most efficient. So what did? Where was the correlation? Well, there were three correlations. Firstly, uh, in your empathy, as measured in the, uh, see if I can get this right, 
the mind in the eyes test. So a way of, um, yes, measuring people's empathy, how well they were able to read and understand others. So the groups that had a higher collective score in this test had better problem solving skills. Secondly, where everyone in the group had made an equal contribution. So not obviously, you know, exactly the same or all doing exactly the same things, but everybody in the group had participated in that uh, solution. So no one was sort of sidelined or left it. Again, coming back to the different themes I've talked about, that no one is inhibited, no one's deferring. Everyone is bringing their true selves to solving this issue. And thirdly, and absolutely best of all, the groups had a higher proportion of women that were better at solving group problems which is a brilliant one. Um, correlation is not causation. Maybe it is that women are have a bit of an advantage in the workplace in terms of empathy in the eyes and mind and reading it, in terms of allowing, allowing even contribution. Certainly, we've all heard about mansplaining and talking over women. Uh, the worst time I ever did that, I was so mortified and horrified, but I have absolutely uh, repeated something a woman has said like 30 seconds after they said it without realizing. And I consider myself, you know, a pretty woke guy. Jesus Christ, if I'm doing that. Yeah, okay. So I have my piece to part in this, but there we go. Relationship respect. That actually the groups that are best at solving these issues are the groups that are best at reading each other and making an equal contribution, allowing everyone to participate. And this should not be a surprise. Think about diversity and inclusion. A large part of the business case for encouraging diversity and inclusion is because it is business sense, that organizations with higher diversity have better performance. And when you look at that, a large part of it is that a wider variety of people is a wider variety of views, that you are more likely to challenge ideas robustly and make them stronger than kind of settling into groupthink and just okaying the suggestion because you all think the same way or because you're deferring to an individual. And indeed, I wasn't aware of this at the time, but the delightful Angelica Galli commented on something and brought to my uh, attention another one of Margaret's uh, sessions, which is about super chickens. Fantastic, super chickens. Um, and it's referring back to an experiment about productivity. Could you make a super flock of super chickens if you take the most productive egg layers out of a flock and group them all together in a single flock? And so essentially that's what they did. They took these different flocks, they took the chickens out that were laying the most eggs and they put them together in a single group. And what they found was pretty horrific. So the regular flocks continued normally, they continued healthily, they were producing, whereas the super chickens were pretty much pecking each other to death. So the ones that were most productive appeared to be the most productive at the expense of each other. So, again, back to, are we focusing on high IQ individuals, high individual achievers and their successes when we should be thinking about the successes and the health of the overall group? So, are we harming the health of the overall group from having sort of superstar individuals that are sort of feeding themselves at the expense of others and harming that equal contribution, lacking that empathy that shows it correlates with the top problem solving of groups. So the takeaway here is that it's just, it's not the individual bricks that make us strong, but it is the mortar that leads to it. How are our people interacting and relating to each other? So, yeah, and that was sort of the call to arms. I mean, the other fascinating examples about just how ways we can encourage helpfulness, social interaction, bringing people together. But yeah, that core concept, we are stronger together as a team.
that we need that purpose to work towards as our individual motivation, but then to recognize the meaning and the value to work together effectively, we need the respect and we need the strong relationships. So the interaction with each other as individual human beings. And really, what a great summary of the entire Engagement Excellence Summit. Okay, thank you very much. You have reached the end of the videos. Uh, if you're seeing this, you've watched the super long one. I think it's going to be sort of like 40 or 50 minutes. I, if you see this, send me a message. Just say, hi, Adam. I actually saw the end of the video. Um, but yeah, what a great summit. Um, as I say, my key takeaways, respect, relationship and purpose. We are back to creative communities with a cause. People want these things and it's not new. These are the same things that have always really wanted out of work for decades. Human beings may change, how we sort of express what we want may have changed, but the fundamentals are still there. And these fundamentals are not driven by individual successes, that really creating a community that recognises each other, that interacts personally, and that cheers for each other and provides people with the chance to bring their true selves to work, to make that equal contribution in the workplace, those are the ones that are ultimately successful. So, if you have the opportunity, Reward Gateway, check out their website, keep an eye out for this session next year, it was a cracker, uh, and I look forward to see what they could do next time. Thank you very much, and cheerio.